the uh let's wash it that mask for anybody it's, it's gone for anybody's security clearance Um, the, uh, <clears throat> so obviously prayer is something that's pretty common to many religions, um, certainly monotheistic religions that, you know, come obviously from Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, they both have prayer. Um, in Judaism, prayer is something important, certainly, but I wouldn't say that it is necessarily the center of Jewish, um, the synagogue is not really the center of Jewish life, really the home. Because most of what we do as Jews is not prayer. Most of what we do as Jews, we have many, many, many commandments, 613 commandments. Um, and, uh, you know, how you keep the Shabbat and how you keep kosher and what you eat and how you, who you, how you get married and the holidays that you celebrate, and what kind of clothes you wear, uh, all of these things, are talked about in the Torah and the Bible and the Talmud, which is Judaism's. Judaism has not only a written tradition, but also an oral tradition about how to do what's in the Bible. And that was written down eventually, about 2,000 years ago, in the Mishnah and the Talmud, uh, when the Jews were exiled from Israel and Babylonia. <coughs> and so the Talmud is written in Arabic. Babylonia, the, the Mishnah, of course, was written in Israel and certainly in Hebrew. Um, and there was a separate Talmud, the Jerusalem Talmud. The exile to Jerusalem in 70 CE. The um, the uh, so so in some ways prayer is really not that central. On the other hand, if you think about the Bible, um, the early characters in the Bible, our ancestors Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Rachel, Leah, Rebecca, they they do talk to God, right? There is a beseeching of God. Uh, we, every week we read a Torah portion, and uh, a couple of weeks ago we read uh, we read uh, Jacob leaving the land of Israel and going to his uncle Laban's house. And on the way there, he stops and he has a dream about his angels going up and down a ladder. And there he says to God, you know, God, if you will protect me, um, you know, and he kind of makes a deal with God. He talks to God, God talks to him. So certainly on some level that's prayer, right? What is prayer? Does prayer have to have structure? Does it not have to have a structure? How do we even know what prayer is? Does it even say in the Torah, in the Bible, that you have to pray, by the way? It doesn't say it clearly. You know, it, it, it says don't mix wool and linen in the same garment. It says don't, you know, cook a, uh, a sheep in its mother's milk. It says don't um, worship idols. But it and, and it says keep the Shabbat. And it says, um, I, you know, bring sacrifices in the temple and it says uh, eat matz on the holiday of Passover and sit in the sukkah on the holiday of Sukkot. But it, there isn't a clear place where it says thou shalt pray. It certainly doesn't say you shall pray three times. So how do we even know the concept of prayer? So the, um, uh, the, uh, the Talmud says that we learn it actually from... Um, from a verse in the Torah, which we say every day uh, in the Shema prayer. And um, here you can see uh, Maimonides quotes it. This is from Maimonides' book of Jewish Law. He says it is a positive commandment uh, in the Torah. He says it is one of the biblical commandments to pray every day. How do we know? It says in the book of Exodus, chapter 23, verse 25, Ba'avadatemetashemalakim. You shall serve the Lord your God. Right? Eved means a servant. La'avod means to serve. And from the oral tradition, we learn that this service of God is prayer. How do we know that it's prayer? By the way, it's not so obvious it's prayer. You would actually think that it's the sacrifices in the temple. And that the Torah does command. And that usually is called avodah, service of God. How do we know it's prayer? Because it says in Deuteronomy, Ula'avdo b'cholavad, you shall serve God with your heart, your whole heart. And the rabbis say, what is the service of the heart? What does that mean? We know what the service of sacrifices is, but what is the service of the heart? Um, so uh, the Talmud says that is prayer. 
serve God with your heart. That's what it says in Deuteronomy. We say this in the famous Shema prayer that we say several times a day, twice a day, uh, that you shall serve God. So we understand from that, from our tradition, that that is prayer, serving God. Now, Maimonides writes, the number of prayers is not biblical. It's not from the Torah. Because all the Torah says is serve God with your heart. Um, and um, the, uh, uh, nor is there a specific formula or a fixed time to biblical prayer, right? Because it doesn't say that anywhere. It doesn't say pray three times. It doesn't say pray at a certain time. So how do we know? Right? It turns out, though, that Jews do pray three times a day. And Maimonides himself says in the later uh, law, that you do have to pray three times a day. And that you have to pray at certain times a day. How do we know that? So um, the Talmud says, Tractate about prayer and blessings. Rabbi Yossi, uh, the son of Rabbi Hanina, said the prayers were um, fixed by our ancestors, by the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that's one opinion. That's the opinion of Rabbi Yossi, the son of Rabbi Hanina. Rabbi Joshua ben Levi said, no. The prayers are said three times a day, not because they were their times or their specific prayers were fixed by our ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but because they parallel the sacrifices. And there was uh, two daily offerings that were brought into the temple. That we know from the Torah. Um, and once the temple was destroyed, the Talmud says, now uh, in place of sacrifices, how will we serve God? The answer is we serve God there actually is another opinion in the Talmud that we serve that, that what takes place in sacrifices is your own table, that your table is an altar and the food you eat is like a sacrifice. Um, you know, you take a blessing and do it right the end. But here the Talmud says prayer. Prayer takes place in sacrifices. That's the opinion of Rabbi Joshua, Rabbi Yeshua. Um, so we have we have an argument here about why we pray three times. Is it because uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob each either one prayed, well, let's see. Um, the Talmud says here, it was taught in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Yossi Bar Chanina. He's the one who said that prayer is fixed based on our ancestors. Um, and we have another uh, um, Mishnah to, uh, which is an ancient relig uh, Jewish religious and biblical legal source to back up the other. So what is it? What, what are these original sources that back up these so the one that is in acts of the opinion of Rabbi Yossi, the son of Rabbi Hanina, that it was fixed by our ancestors, says Abraham fixed the morning prayer. As it says, uh, Abraham got up in the morning and went to the place uh, to, uh, to stand where he stood before. Him. Uh, it says that in Bereshit, in Genesis 19. And the word to stand uh, we have a tradition means to pray, as it says in the book of Psalms, that Pinchas stood up to pray. As you see, the word standing can mean to pray. When it says Abraham stood before God, we understand that that was prayer. And when was that? He got up early in the morning. So Abraham, we have a tradition, prayed the morning, Shacharit, and that's where we get it. Isaac prayed in the afternoon, Mincha, what we call the afternoon service. As it says, and Isaac went out to speak in the field before evening. And the word to speak, sicha, means prayer. How do we know that? From another verse in Psalms, which says, um, which says, uh, prayer of the afflicted, when he's faint and pours out his complaint before God. And the word used there is the same word that's used with regard to Isaac going out of the field, sicha. Sicha in modern Hebrew conversation, but um, uh, just like it says in Psalms, comparing the word sikha, speaking to prayer, so when it says Isaac went out into the field to speak before evening, we assume that was prayer. And so we see Abraham sort of praying associated with the morning, 
Isaac praying says is at night, and Jacob, of course, the night. Uh, I'm sorry, Isaac the afternoon, and Jacob, the Talmud says, fixed the night time. How do we know that? Because it says in Bereshit in Genesis 28:11 that Abraham was leaving um, Israel and he was going to Laban's house. Wasn't there before. And just before he had that dream about the ladder and angels going up and down, it says in Hebrew, "Vayifga b'makom He bumped into that place. And the rabbis say, uh, "Bumping into vayifga encountered is the word English." Um, is prayer. How do we know that? The answer is from a verse in Jeremiah, which says, And you do not pray for this people and um, or sing on their behalf. And don't encounter me, says God. He's uh, saying to, uh, I guess to Jeremiah, not to pray for the people to stay in the land. The people have to be exiled. Um, and so you see that here, the same word is used, the word used in Jeremiah for prayer is the one that is used with regard to Jacob uh, coming to Mount Moriah on his way from Israel to, to uh, the house of Laban. And so, uh, and there, of course, he has this dream, and he, he does talk to God. And so you see that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob each prayed, one prayed in the morning, one in the afternoon, one in the evening. And therefore, that backs up the first opinion in the Talmud of Rabbi Yossi, that prayer is fixed based on when our ancestors prayed. In. And that's why we pray. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a biblical obligation to pray. It's, that could just be a hint at it in these verses, because again, you don't have a verse in the Torah that says pray to him three times a day. Um, you know, prayer, as Maimonides said, the idea of praying at least once a day not necessarily a specific formula, but just praying from the heart once a day, that is a biblical obligation. We learned that from uh, serve God with your life. Uh, but, but, but we clearly have a tradition that we pray three times a day. And so the question is, maybe that comes from these hints in these verses about Abraham. Now, by the way, you could ask, well, Abraham didn't pray three times a day. He prayed in the morning. Isaac didn't pray three times a day. He prayed in the afternoon. But you know, so the answer is that it, it's it's we learn it from them, but it doesn't again it doesn't mean it's a biblical obligation. It might still be the idea of praying three times a day is a rabbinic Talmudic obligation from the Mishnah. Uh, although praying once a day, praying something once a day, is definitely a biblical obligation. Now the other opinion, remember, in the Talmud was that it it wasn't because of Jacob, it was because of the sacrifice. Once the temple was destroyed. Synagogues had to be built, and Jews always prayed, but they prayed on their own, and they prayed spontaneously. They fulfilled their biblical obligation of prayer, but that when the temple was destroyed, the rabbis fixed three times a day prayer in synagogues in order to parallel the sacrifices with the temple. And that is the opinion of Rabbi Yossi. Okay, so that's the opinion. Uh, that is the second. And um, the other opinion, which was that it parallels the sacrifices, is the opinion of Rabbi Joshua, the son of Levi. And, and, uh, and here is something to back that up. Why is it that the morning prayer can only be said until noon? Because the morning sacrifice that was biblical, that was brought in the temple every day, could only be brought in. Rabbi Joshua says it's about four hours, because, that, because he held that the morning sacrifice could only be brought in. What about the afternoon service? Uh, that's because the afternoon sacrifice that had to be brought every day was brought um, from the afternoon until the evening. 
So why do we have a nighttime um, prayer service? It, it, it was only two daily sacrifices on the morning and the afternoon, according to the Bible. So why do we have a nighttime prayer service? The answer is because the, the, there were things still burning on the altar left over from the day, um, into, and they would burn. But there is an opinion in the Talmud, by the way, that, um, that the nighttime prayer service is not as much of an obligation as the morning prayer service, because it doesn't parallel the sacrifice. So the daily sacrifice is Leviticus. So that is the two sides of the argument. Uh, is it because of our ancestors? We see them praying morning, evening, night. Or is it because when the temple was destroyed, we needed prayers to be prayers? So who's right, by the way? Now, of course, in a very, you know, in, in Judaism, it doesn't have to be this one person who's right. Obviously, uh, the law is still going to be, both opinions agree that you pray three times a day. So we can just pray three times a day and it matter who's really right. But the Talmud actually does kind of answer it. The Talmud says, um, we have a proof for both opinions. We have, we've already backed up both opinions with earlier uh, earlier legal writings. And, um, and so the Talmud resolves it this way. Talmud says, uh, Talmud says, um, Uh, to feel out the prayers were indeed fixed by our ancestors, Abraham in the morning, Isaac in the afternoon, Jacob in the night. But when the rabbis uh, um, uh, installed the prayers, when they made a decree that people should pray, when they created the rabbinic law that people should pray three times a day, they were relying on the sacrifice they brought and so the Talmud sort of ends up with a theme. Uh, the, 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 our ancestors did indeed pray, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, one in the night. And, and in addition, the rabbis, when they fixed prayer, they were relying on the fact that it was happening. So it, it sounds like it's really And of course, uh, that, that's true for us. So before the temple was destroyed, um, there was not a rabbinic obligation to pray three times a day. There was a biblical obligation, as Maimonides says, just to pray once a day. And it didn't have a specific time. And it didn't have a specific day. You could, as long as you said something to God each day, you had fulfilled the obligation of doing it. And that's still true. If you get up in the morning and you say, oh, thank you, God, for restoring my soul, or you say, uh, blessed are you, God, who you know made this bread that I'm about that's prayer. And you've fulfilled the biblical obligation to pray. If you're just praying your own words from your heart once a day, you fulfilled the biblical obligation. There's a rabbinic obligation to pray three times a day at a specific time. Memory of the sacrifices, and this parallel. The, uh, so before the temple was destroyed, sacrifices were brought at specific times, but you didn't even necessarily live in Jerusalem. You could be, you know, miles away in a different part of Israel, and the high priest was bringing sacrifices. Right? He was bringing sacrifices on behalf of nation, but but um, people at that time would still pray to God, speak to God. Now that's all separate from, there is a separate commandment to say the Shema prayer, because the Shema, which is basically the declaration of God, um, there's three paragraphs from the Bible, um, that's a separate obligation, a biblical obligation to say the Shema um, in the morning and at night, because it says, I shall say these words in the morning. So, uh, so that's not really prayer. In other words, the Shema is this separate commandment, the declaration that has to be done by God, and it has to be done twice a day. And then once at night, when you wake up, you go to sleep, you know, around the time of the sacrifice. So uh, well, we do that as part of the prayer service in the morning and the evening. But even if you didn't pray, even if you just prayed once from your own heart, uh, you would still want to say the Shema once a day. So it's a separate... Um, there's a whole question about um, the uh, so let's talk about the nature of prayers. So um, you know one one question is why why pray? Um, 
you know, is prayer important? Uh, other than it being perhaps a commandment to serve God with your heart, um, you know, there are certain philosophical conundrums that merge around prayer. Right? What's sort of the philosophical? What's the what's the problem there? Or I'll ask you, what do you think the purpose of prayer is? What's the purpose of prayer? What what for you? It is not like a right or wrong answer. What what for you is the purpose? What would you if somebody said to you, what's the prayer? Why do you pray? If you do. What would you say? I feel like to create a relationship with Hashem. Okay, create a relationship with God. Does that does the purpose of prayer change depending on whether you're dealing with like a structured, a rehearsed prayer, or whether you're just speaking from your heart? Good question. What do you think? What's your opinion? I think there's like there's something to be said about like the vulnerability of praying from your heart and kind of like the improvised nature of that and to just like announce what you're what you're grateful for. But I also see the benefits of a more structured prayer because um sometimes it's good to start off with the structured prayer to to under to, to set the foundation and to go on and speak from your heart. So I think there's benefits to both. Exactly right. In fact, we even have words for this. One is called keva, fixed prayer, and one is called kavana, prayer with intent. Now, they don't have to be separate, uh, but you're absolutely right. You know, if you're just praying and saying the words, so what really is that? And if you're only praying from the heart, why does Judaism have fixed prayer? Why not just have prayer? Right? The answer, of course, is what you're saying. If you only have prayer from the heart, it may be more meaningful, but you might not pray. And if you only have fixed prayer, you may pray and just say the words, but maybe not thinking of it. So obviously, we want to bring uh, both together. In fact, the Talmud sort of says this. We clearly have fixed prayer. The Talmud says that a prayer, in order to be a prayer service, has to have three parts. It has to have praising God, it has to have asking for our needs, and it has to have thank you. Um, and so the Amidah, the standing silent prayer that we say um, at least on weekdays, has those three parts, those three blessings beginning praise God, three at the end, thank God in the middle, 13 blessings which declare or either ask for our needs or talk back to God to give those. Um, but the Talmud says any prayer that doesn't have something new in it is not a prayer. In other words, according to the Talmud, it sounds like you were, were there was a structure of prayer, but within that structure, you're supposed to also put your own words. Uh, you know, or else it's not very personal. Now, there is, I mean, that, the nature of prayer, I think, in every religion is the same kind of between structure and personal. It's always going to be, right? It's the same as the conflict between God as personal and God as the infinite creator of the world. Right? The infinite creator of the world is a God that's not very accessible. Um, but yet, you know, it's, it's the most Western religions. Islam, indeed, God is also very personal. Um, and, and that's kind of contradictory, just like prayer that is both structured and personal. You know, contradictory. But you know, I think if, if prayer were only personal and only spontaneous, I'm not sure why we would do it. And, uh, and if prayer was you know, only just saying words and didn't have to have to be personal, then, of course, it's lacking. So I think, of course, what we're supposed to do is both. You know, some Jews err on one side, some Jews err on the other side. If you go to a more liberal congregation, you say we need a structure. If you go to a form congregation, it might be very personal, but it might not be as structured. It might not be as, as rigorous. So, rare. But if you go to an Orthodox congregation, they might be very structured during the day, but it might be lacking. There's a lot to pray, and they're trying to say all the words, and maybe it's lacking personal intent. I don't know. I mean, obviously, some people have both. not easy to do, right? To have a real structure. 
prayer. And if you have a prayer book, you know that you have to say X, you know, amount of stuff in the prayer service. Now, it does say in the Shulchan Aruch, Code of Jewish Law, it does say it is better to say um, a little bit with intent than a lot without intent. That's called Kabana in the Arabic. So, so, you know, if you have it sometimes, especially people who are new to prayer, especially prayer in Hebrew, they might say to me, well, what am I going to do? I, I can't keep my attention on Hebrew speaking. So, of course, the answer is that you shouldn't say everything. You should say less. Pick one paragraph, or say two paragraphs, but do it with your heart, do it with intent, explain what the words mean. You know, some of the more philosophical issues we can take up. Um, you know, how does, uh, why pray to a God that is omniscient? God knows everything. God knows how to pray. But he doesn't. So somebody gave the answer before that's better than Galatia. So obviously that's, that's the fifth answer. But, uh, you know, a lot of times our prayers seem like they're structured in a way that we're asking God for things. God has already done for us. A lot of times, by the way, you pray for something, you don't get it. You pray for healing, somebody dies. You pray for, you know, whatever it is you pray for. Right? So how does it work? Prayers that are mild, or prayers that are real, prayers that are not. Is God listening? Is he just saying no sometimes, yes sometimes? Well, why is it that sometimes people who never pray and they get exactly what they want? Right? So... So obviously, we don't really know the answers to these questions of why we get what we get, or why we don't get what we get, or whether prayer is actually done as well as we think it is. Interesting, the Hebrew word prayer is lahit halel, and the Hebrew verb form of that is a reflexive verb. Lahit pa'el verb form is to do something to oneself. Right? If you want to say, uh, get dressed, you say, uh, tilbash, you should get dressed. If you want to say, I got dressed, you say, itlabashti, I got dressed. In Hebrew, there's you have one you know, verb, but you put it in different forms, and it means different things. Um, and so when you have that verb form, it often is about something one does to themselves. And, and that's what the Hebrew verb to pray, lehit alel, is in the verb form of doing something to oneself. So some people say that really prayer is very much, it's not about God, it's about me. Um, it, it requires me being in prayer to God for it to work, um, but it's really about, you know, perhaps it's about a moral measure. Um, maybe it's about just the act of standing before God. It's interesting that the Talmud says that you have to have God asking for your needs. I wouldn't have thought, right? I would have thought the most important part of prayer might be praising God, thanking why is asking for my needs, God, you know, you give knowledge to human beings or, you know, praying for with a blessing for healing, with a blessing for redemption, blessing for going back to Israel. All of these things are in the Amidah, the standing time of prayer. Yeah. So obviously part of the answer is that when you ask for what you need from God, you realize that you are not the master of the universe, that you don't, you don't have access to everything, and that there is a God. So prayer may also be a philosophical, theological undertaking, but that's not always intellectual. Right? It's in the heart. You know, to say God provides is one thing, but to actually know it maybe takes some acute time to meditate. Now it's an interesting question: Did did is what God wanted sacrifices when the temple was destroyed? It's always a prayer to take its place, or no? Did God really want prayer or something else? And uh, but we got the sacrifices because of that for some reason. So Maimonides in his book of Jewish, his book of Jewish law, he certainly talks about prayer in the end of the day and he does it in the end. But in his book of Jewish philosophy, the guide to the perplexed, he says an interesting thing. Uh, it's a bit controversial, but he says uh, uh, he says that God really did not want sacrifices. God wanted either prayer or maybe even something. Um, but that when the Jewish people worshipped the golden calf, God realized that the Jewish people 
needed something to relate to, and so he gave the temple the exact same thing. But it was there as an educational So th th that's one opinion. There's many other people on it. There are others who disagree. Nakamura, you know, 50 years later, says, you know, that can't be true because you have a commandment to the effect that right? even before uh, the Jewish people worship the calf, and people much earlier in history bring sacrifices. You know, and uh, Noah brings a sacrifice. We have a uh, Mishnah. The Mishnah is, again, it's the written down form of the tradition um, from the first century. Uh, and most of it is very legal, but some of it is more sort of moral and, and, uh, and instructive, uh, and sort of theologically instructive. And it's called Pirkei Avot, Chapter of the Fathers. And there's a Mishnah. A paragraph in Perkebath that says Shimon the righteous uh, was uh, one of the last people of the land who ran for the sultan, which is this like son of peace kind of book. And he used to say, on three things the world stands on Torah, I guess that means the study of Torah or the reading of the Torah, Allah Avodah, service. Now the translated here is temple service. It doesn't say temple service. Avodah is temple service, but it means service. And so prayer would be taken, would also be taken into account, and on uh, acts of kindness to others. And so uh, Torah, prayer, and acts of kindness, those are the three things the world stands. So even though prayer you know, doesn't seem to be a very big thing in the Torah, um, we definitely have a tradition that's foundational. That, you know, also later on, Mystics, especially in the Hasidic world, very big thing is very concentrated on the Torah. No one else knows about the Torah. So, so. Um, and there are different kinds of prayer, right? There's uh, there's there's uh, prayer of standing silent prayer, the Amidah. There's the Shema that I mentioned, but there's obviously things like Psalms. There's also blessings. Blessings, there's many, many blessings. And only one blessing, maybe two. Are actually commanded in the Bible. But the one that's commanded in the Torah is a great sacrifice. It's a blessing of the Torah. Because it says, and you shall eat and be satisfied and bless the Lord your God. Um, but we, uh, the Talmud says that you can't take something from the world without, without with it. The Talmud brings two different uh, verses in the Torah. One says, the heavens are the heavens to God and the earth belongs to God. That's, these are uh, there's another uh, verse in Psalms that says everything belongs to God. So the Talmud says, what is it? Is the earth belong to God or does it belong to human beings? So the Talmud says, before you say a blessing, it belongs to God. After you say a blessing, it belongs to God. And so we have many, many blessings. Uh, there's three basic categories of blessings. There's blessings before taking pleasure from the world, uh, essentially before eating and drinking, and before smelling good smell. There are blessings. Um, there are blessings uh, whose function is to praise God. And that usually is associated with things that move us emotionally, things that move us as human beings finally. So if you see thunder and lightning, you know, powerful lightning, or you see something beautiful, a mountain or an ocean for the first time, there's a blessing you can say. And you say, Blessed are you, God. And because there are things that happen, right? Sometimes there's the way that I view it is there's two different orientations of blessing, right? Sometimes we are moved by things in the world, and we want to link it to something. We we can use that experience to bless God. Something beautiful happens to us. We can use that experience to say how this is beautiful, um, and that's one kind of blessing. There's another kind of blessing, which called blessing on food, in which we just usually take it for granted. You eat an apple, you eat an apple. You don't think much about it. So you have to make a blessing. Blessed are you, God, who creates us with the tree. Because it's a tree. 
And so in some ways, the blessing is there when we are moved, the blessing captures that emotion. But when we're not moved, the blessing creates the emotion, creates the sense. Of and then we have a third kind of blessing, which is the blessing that we make towards each other. It's a slightly different structure. It's blessed are you, God, who sanctified us with your hand and beside us. Uh, we also have a very well known prayer that we say in uh, every morning. When we wake up, the first thing, if you think about waking up in the morning, it is, uh, I think it's actually a un, an, it's, it's a moment that is the most powerful moment of the day. We don't pay much attention. Right? What do you do when you wake up? Anybody know that? So usually the first thing we think is, oh, And, um, and you know, so people press the snooze button like this and that, what? If you think about it, the moment of waking is the most powerful moment there is. Because it's the moment you realize that you exist. A moment before you woke up, you actually had no idea that you are you. Now it sounds strange. You're going to think, well, I dream sometimes. But in a dream, you don't necessarily even know you're you. And you don't know, you don't always dream. Like, like sometimes you wake up and you're like, oh, I'm me. You know, like I often have wondered if you died in your sleep, would you have known that you died? Uh, do, you, do you even are you conscious? Do you even know that you're you? Like you don't know anything sometimes in your sleep. You sleep for eight hours, you're not on the on none of it all. And um, and so waking up is the realization. Of existence and the realization that we are not sort of the ruler of ourselves. And it's an incredible moment, I think, of gratitude, potentially a moment of gratitude to God uh, that we are alive. It's the realization that we exist. It's shocking. It's like going from death to life. And, um, and so we have a prayer that we say every morning when we get up. And this is the prayer. Modea anilefani. I am thankful before you, Melech Kaiva God, sovereign, who is living and existing, or who exists, Shechazarta be Nishmati Vakana. You have returned to me my soul with mercy. Rabba Amunaf, great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. Right? Because you trust that God will wake up, that you'll get up in a moment. You actually don't know. I used to be very afraid of this. When I was Very recently, I used to be really quite scared of going to sleep. I didn't want to go to sleep. I want to get up. Because I just thought, like, I'm checking out. Like, that, that's crazy. I'm just like, I'm not going to know anything. I'm not going to be, there's nothing going on. You know, I'm just going to be sleeping. So, uh, and, and I think on some level, there's sometimes anxiety. Am I going to get up? I don't really know. I don't control it. And so we get up, and there's this incredible moment of awareness, of realization that exists. We capitalize on that by saying, I'm thankful before you because you have returned my soul to me with mercy, with grace. Great is your trust. We get up in the morning. And that's, uh, we realize that we are dependent. And so that's a very powerful thing. Come to your question. So I think that's a very powerful I think, you know, whether. Whether this is the prayer that you say, or you say something else in your heart, um, I think it's important not to let the moment of waking go by without thinking. It's really powerful. And, and that's part of the purpose of prayer, is to, is to help us to, to capture the moment of waking. Yeah, sorry. Do you have your hand up? Yeah. Um, yeah, but actually, I. <laughs> I learned this prayer, um, you know, in earlier versions of this course, oh, and I never... find it um, to be very moving, and I use it. Oh. And you know, you always discover something. And so here, I'm focusing on living an everlasting King. So even while 
we're asleep and we're completely out of it, God's always living. He's always, God is always there. That, that's a good point, is that in a certain sense, we're contrasting God to our sleep. In fact, there's a medrash that says that when God created the human being, the human being was created in the divine image. So the angels said to God, wait, is this God? They thought the human being was God until the human being went to sleep. And they realized, oh, that's not God. <laughs> so yeah, I think you're exactly right. I think the I think those words, living and existing, uh, everlasting king, living and everlasting king, I, I think you're right, being contrasted with uh, our state of sleep. And, and, and I'll, I'll just add, I mean, two other words that stand out in this for me. One is, is mercy. The, that you have restored my soul with mercy. I mean, it's just such a powerful um, feeling to receive from God. Mm -hmm. And the other is great is your faithfulness, which I'd never even considered before, that God is faithful to us. I thought we thought we were supposed to be faithful to, to God. And um, right. so it's... Getting up each morning is in prayer. Yeah. Tommy, you should convert already. No, I don't. <laughs> Stop lying to yourself. You're <laughs> Jewish. Uh, it's good to, uh, to learn from. Learn from <laughs> Thank you. But this one really, it just, it just keeps with me. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's, that's, that's very important. And uh, the Talmud says that sleep is a 60th of death. Because it is. It's a little bit like death. It's not death. And that's why, actually, it's efficient to wash our hands when we wake up uh, with a cup, not just from the sink, but uh, same way one might wash their hands with a cup. It's a sense of depth and depth. The other uh, blessing that I find extremely powerful to share with you now is the blessing that said, uh, I'm sure I've brought this many times also um, but um, I think Judaism is probably unique in having blessing for the bathroom and you don't say it in the bathroom you don't say it in the bathroom but after you go to the bathroom you wash your hands you go outside and then you say this blessing so blessed are you God uh, who has formed the human being with wisdom and created in them many holes and many tubes it is revealed and known before your throne of glory if you would open one of them the wrong time close one it would be impossible to stand to get up and to stand before you even for a moment. Blessed are you, God, the healer of all flesh, your Lord. So it's a long blessing, actually. Um, I think it's in the category of blessings like blessings that you say on a rainbow, blessings that you say on an ocean, on a river. So what we call a blessing of praise to God. Right? Something miraculous that's happening in the world, something powerful, moving that's happening in the world. And you use that to say, oh, wow, this, this world has a problem. And the idea that going to the bathroom, the realization of how the human body works, that it does work, is so wondrous that how can you not capitalize on to praise God? And that, you know, saying a blessing on a mountain, on a beautiful mountain, you know, you see the Grand Canyon, so that makes sense. But, um, but it's interesting. We would not, I don't think it's as intuitive the idea that somehow the realization we're going to the bathroom our body works in a miraculous way and that that prompts us to praise god uh, and 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 the, and the language here is very powerful it's not just you know it's it's a god who's very very high right god who is uh, right the healer of all flesh and the doer of wonders right it's the wondrousness of god And, 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 and what's fascinating about it is, right, it's a moment at which human beings are kind of very vulnerable, like emotionally vulnerable, because it's, it's, it's one of our most animalistic moments. And, uh, you know, it's why as human beings we hide when we close the door, find the thing we can spray. There's, there's, we have a certain shame of being so animalistic. So, you know, and, 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 and having a blessing I think you come out of the bathroom and, and, and it, it raises an experience of wonderfulness. Uh, instead of there being shame, instead of there being uh, 
sense that, oh, I'm no better than an animal. They're just the opposite. It's little wonder. Miranda was like, find God. You can find God in going to the bathroom. You can do it by That, I think, is what we need. So, um, let's see, next week we'll do a different topic. Hopefully, we're going to. Uh, have this class, uh, this this sort of structure of the class is topical. Uh, we'll do for three more weeks, seven, fourteen, first. Uh, no, it's not actually not sent the dates. So if you didn't get the email about the dates, that's fine. That's uh, there is some possibility I might change the date. So if you uh, I assume you got the email with the link to the booklet and the dates. If you didn't get that, I have right. a quick question about the classes. So um, I missed the first one, and I also will be traveling in December. So w is there going to be another round of these classes? Yeah. So I will. So first of all, I think I'll. I, I might have recorded the last one. Okay. Trying to record the others. Um, but yeah, the, the truth is that this class is actually ongoing. It's going to mm -hmm. go on uh, even after these five weeks. It just happens that these five weeks um, had specific topics. Uh, we, we probably will revisit these topics. Of course, this happened before. That was true. Uh, and uh, yeah, so th this, this class will keep going. Okay, thank you. Okay. Have a good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank good you. Good night.